turn But I'm leaving today I'm gonna find a place Where nobody knows my name The river that leads to the ocean My name is Marcus Coos This program is called The Gypsy Gentleman I've been tattooing for 22 years when I string back through all the cool memories I have of traveling all over the world, I started thinking, wouldn't it be cool if I could share all that? What it's like to be a traveling tattooer. What it's like to interact with all these great artists and to drop into their lives. Hopefully I'll be able to expand your ideas of what tattooing is. And hopefully I'll be able to teach you a little bit about the world of tattooing, a little bit about human interaction, a little bit about music, about style, about originality. That's the mission of this. Uh, this is episode number one, New York City. We're in the heart of it here in the Big Apple. We're gonna be doing a project where we go to the Rubin Museum on 17th and 7th, which is one of the largest collections of Tibetan and Himalayan art in New York City. And I'm gonna be taking there with me Thomas Hooper of London, England, and Virginia Elwood of NYC, two of the best tattooers in the city right now. And I chose New York City because I've been tattooing in and out of New York for 20 years. I used to work at Fun City for Jonathan Shaw 20 years ago when there's only two shops open on the Lower East Side, maybe four in all of Manhattan. Now you go to Lower West Fourth and you're gonna find 20 shops on one block. So the whole tattoo landscape in New York City has changed a lot, as has the landscape of New York. So we're gonna drop in, check out all of New York. You're gonna to get to see the streets. I'm gonna take you to a really cool record store in uh, Carroll Gardens, which is a super cool neighborhood in Brooklyn. You're gonna check that out. You're gonna meet some cool folks over there. It's run by tattoo artists, and they collect antiques, and they sell coffee and old school LPs. It's gonna be super cool. New York City, as a location for tattooing, has a certain mystique. In the 1930s on the Bowery, there was a series of tattoo shops that had a thing on the window that said, Black Eye Specialist. Basically what that meant was, watch out for us because we might give you a black eye. It started that they would have a barber shop, they'd have a penny arcade, and they'd do tattooing on the side. They probably ran hookers, sold drugs, and God knows what else went on in those places. But all the sailors and street ruffians would all go in there and get these old school American designs, maybe get their picture taken afterwards, which is why there's a lot of cool photo documentation of that, and then do a little bit of drinking, a little bit of brawling. Say you had to go back on the ship, you're a Navy guy and you got a big old shiner, you'd go in there and they'd put makeup on your eye to cover it up so that you didn't have a black eye. But the, the sideline was that the windows had these super cool gold and black, gold leaf eyes in the center of the glass that said black eye specialist, which I always thought was super cool. In fact, in one of my early shops, I stuck that on the window and I had to explain this 20 times a week, what a black eye specialist is. That sort of rough and tumble and New York City tough guy thing was definitely associated with tattooing here in the city. Even when I tattooed here in the late 80s and early 90s, there were so few shops here and it was all still legal and underground that it had that kind of mystique, that kind of tough side to it, that quality. That's pretty much evaporated now, but New York City in itself still has that mystique. And like most things in New York, the surface is a little eroded. You know, it takes some time to break into New York. You have to kind of look underneath and then you find it. And I'm gonna take you back in a little bit. I'll show you a little bit how, how it looks on the outside, how it's a little rough, and then when we get inside, you get to see all the cool stuff that's going on here in New York City. Okay, here we are on the Bowery. It's directly above Delancey Street, Lower East Side, Lower West Side. This is the famed Bowery where all the sailors, hookers, criminals and lowlifes used to congregate in the 1930s. This is also a hotbed for prostitution and, and whatnot. It happened to be where all the original tattoo shops were in this neighborhood. Right here you can see this is the Bowery. It carries all the way up here until you come up to the Chrysler building. This whole neighborhood still has a little bit flavor of the old days. It's a little bit run down. There's a couple missions along here. You see bums sleeping on the street. The buildings are all burned out still has the magic that it used to have back in the day. Pretty cool, this is the center of all tattooing in New York City. Most of the people walking up and down the street have no idea what used to take place here back in the 1930s. And this is it. 
in the 1930s when you know tattooing was still very isolated from uh, the bulk of society that they thrived in those environments kind of seedy New York underbelly which I think is cool Here I am bright and early, taking you around the streets of Brooklyn. It's a little bit miserable today and rainy, but there's some pretty cool places around here. I love this neighborhood. There's some really cool shops around here and restaurants. And I'm gonna take you to this one right over here called Black Gold Records. It's run by tattooers and they also sell really cool old antiques and you get a cup of coffee. This is my kind of place. Check it out. How you doing? Nice to see you. Really good, really good. We're having a fucking great day. I want to get a cup of coffee. All right. Can you hook me up with a coffee with maybe a... Sure I know it's probably like against the rules, but we got Splenda. Yeah, have Splenda. This shop is basically an amalgam of all the things that I think are super cool. Like old school antiques, old school tattoos, a nice gentlemanly cup of coffee, some records, like old, you know, super cool records. So I just have to bring you down here and show you this place and introduce you to it. So what, how long you guys been here? It's been about nine months at this point. Cool, boy, cool. and what's the reaction? People digging it? Yeah, I mean, we hit the ground running, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. People, yeah. I mean, you're turning over stuff, the antiques go? Everything moves. Everything That's moves. That's cool, man. That's We're cool. running to keep up. Yeah, yeah. We're hustling. And the records, too? Everything. We, we, we run out and get them. We get You go to, like, people's houses? People call, we put out ads, we do word of mouth, people respond. That's cool. Like, how did it work? Like, you got together with, I guess, with Daniel Santoro? With Daniel and his, his wife, Summer. We all got together. Okay, and did he do tattoos on you? I yeah, used to tattoo her, right? And that's Smith Street around the corner? Yep, we knew each okay. other from when we lived back in New Jersey. Okay. We went to cool. high school together. Hey, what's up, man? It's nice to see you. I haven't seen you since I tattooed you. I know. In the motherland of my family's vacation home. Indeed. What are we doing? Like a lobster or lobster. something with a slice yeah. of limon? That's correct. Very cool, very correct. cool. How long have you guys had this going on? Uh, about nine months, if I'm not mistaken. About nine months we've been open here. And But you're tattooing all the time too, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm still tattooing full time. Yeah, it's Smith Street, which yeah, is like right here in the neighborhood. That's correct. Two blocks and away. And who else is working there? Um, Steve Boltz, Eli Quinters, and Burt Kraft. Yeah, that's it's a pretty heavy duty lineup yeah, you guys uh, got going on. You're doing a lot of buying of the antiques and then sort of yeah, just flipping them and you got new stuff coming in. That's pretty in much what I do, yeah. Kind of People stuff. ask like what, what it is that I carry and I can't really exactly put my finger on it, but again, it comes more down to aesthetic. Because, you know, the shop is, the tattoo shop is two blocks from here, so as yeah, far yeah. as the stuff I was carrying, I was sort of, um, you know, catering to maybe that clientele. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. that's what I was collecting myself, you know, through collecting tattoos. I have, I have a relatively large collection of antique tattoos last which yeah. led me into collecting folk art in general, which led me collecting to collect carnival stuff, which led me to collect kind of just general antiques, you know, so yeah, it's yeah. kind of that evolution. So it was the stuff I was buying anyway. Yeah. You know what? It's awesome to see you again. Good I wish you, I had yeah. seen you more often, yeah, but uh, yeah, well, yeah, I'll stop by. Yeah, come on. I, I wish you guys the best of luck. Thank you so much. Cool, man. Awesome. Good to see you, Mark. Okay. All right. Bye, bud. going right now we're gonna go meet with Virginia and we're gonna meet with Thomas and you're gonna see what cool people they are and you're gonna get to see the amazing art at the Rubin Museum right now uh, it's on 17th and 7th in Manhattan uh, it's one of the largest collections of Tibetan and Himalayan art in New York City and we're very lucky to have permission to go in there and shoot the Himalayan art collection so I chose Thomas and Virginia because I feel like it's gonna be a really good mix yeah, I'm so glad you could be here today. Yeah, thank you for you know making me part of it. Yeah, it's cool, man. And the lady of the day, hey Miss Virginia. What's up, sweetheart? <laughs> We have total access to the Himalayan art collection. I'm going to take them around. You're going to get to see them being uh, exposed to all this really cool Himalayan art. Then we're going to go together and we're going to use all three of us. We're going to draw three medium-sized tattoos using our inspiration in that moment in front of all that cool art to create three pieces where we meld all of our styles. We're going to interact with each other and then we're going to do those tattoos for free on people. We're going to do them to show you that you can tattoo for the sake of tattooing. You can do it for the sake of the art. And that sometimes three consciousnesses are better than one. Okay, we're in the Rubin Museum now. We're in the Himalayan Gallery. And I got Virginia Elwood and Thomas Hooper with me. So we're gonna roam around now and look at some of this cool art. 
and uh, begin the process. The feeling in here is really transcendent, you know, there's something about being the presence of so many pieces of art that when they were created the people were coming from like a really good spiritual place and that kind of emanates out. So let's walk around a little bit and look at some of this cool stuff in here. Fairly sort of simplistic and very base sculptures, which more ornate. And then of course, and it sort of re-emerged and so when I look at the things, it's the thing, I'm drawn to things like in this tanga, this, like in this, this is the wheel of life, the wheel of existence. And this form uh, is sort of like very traditional Tibetan Tonga painting, but and it's been overplayed a lot in tattooing, you know, the Tibetan skulls and and the you know fierce Tibetan deity and stuff. But there's something about that, like when I tattoo, I love that power. I start collecting mentally all the stuff like really cool color dynamic contrasts, like the deep rich greens they use versus like a really terracotta red. You know, I'm really attracted to that kind of explosion, the fire and energy of this stuff. It's so primitive, and yet the, the aesthetic is so much more evolved. This stuff, is there anything that attracts you in this, in this art? Like how you would interpret a tattoo, or is it? The impact it has on me is, is almost purely visual. You know, so dynamic. It's achieving what I'm trying to achieve more in my tattooing, which is just imparting, like you were saying, that power. Yeah. And, um, you know, the really dynamic images, a lot of black, a lot of color, maybe some texture in there, you know. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, when I look at this, I don't see, okay, I would take that and I would tattoo that image this way. But I definitely look at the color, I look at the different textures in it, I, I, the composition, everything is, is inspiring, mm -hmm. but uh, in more of an abstract way for me, I think. So, let's talk a little bit about New York, because you're not from New York originally. From Are upstate you? New York, okay. Rochester. But then you did a little walkabout. I did a lot of walkabouts. I, okay, I so give us a quick walkabout. I had the quick walkabout. Born and raised in Rochester, New York. Yeah. I was a dancer. Rebelled, got my first tattoo when I was 16 from a guy with one arm up in Rochester, who I, really? maybe you know who this is. I don't remember his name. What a great story. One arm. And I thought that I had made it up. I thought for years, how could this tribal pot leaf on my shoulder <laughs> have been done by a guy with one arm. <laughs> but then, through the miracles of Facebook, the guy that I went with, this guy Brian, that I wasn't even friends with, but he had a car and a fake ID, so we decided to go get tattoos. He got like a skull with uh, lacrosse sticks. With a pot leaf? <laughs> no, I got the pot leaf. He posted on my Facebook page years later, I haven't talked to him in 15 years, and he says, remember when we went and got our first tattoos together and you got the guy with the one arm? And so I knew I hadn't made it up, but I really thought that that, that was fake. How do you stretch your skin? I remember <laughs> having to sit like this, and he had a stump. He did have a stump. Oh, okay. There was no gloves involved, but I remember, <laughs> I mean, it's... Maybe a magnum condom. The something. tattoo doesn't look like it. he really stretched the skin that much. Yeah, I guess, well, I mean... It's not like you need Michelangelo to do a tribal <laughs> pot leaf. They basically gave all the tribal I mean, pot leaves to the one-armed Andy. They're yeah. like, okay. Well, so anyways, so then I moved down to Manhattan when I was maybe 17 or 18. I wasn't tattooing yeah. at that point. Okay. I was still trying to become a professional uh, ballet dancer and f failed. On, well, not failed. And then I chose not to do that. It was too much. Yeah, um, yeah. Not enough balance in that lifestyle for me. It's really hard. So I moved to Boston. Yeah. Didn't know anyone there, just moved there, enrolled in community college, okay. and took some drafting classes, like maybe I'll be an architect, I don't know, I'm just going to try things. My mom was an artist. I never really went down that path because I was really focused on dancing. 